It'd be great. Thank you. All right, here we go. Welcome, everybody. Come on in. Welcome, welcome, welcome today. Hi, everybody. Open up your cameras if you can. Hello, Anna, with that beautiful face. Hello, Jennifer and Dave. Hi, Eileen. Great to see you. Hi, Cheryl, in your backyard. Good to see everybody. Come on in. Open up your cameras and uh, pop into the chat for me. Where are you in the world? It's very comforting to know where everybody is. Come on in. We have a huge group today. We have almost 1,200 of you who are registered from all over the world. I'm gonna hop into the spotlight and welcome you. Thank you for being here today. Um, if you are new to the Fireside Chats, my name is Carrie Cardinelli. I am um, delighted to be your MC for today, welcome. Um, look forward to a fun and interactive day today for learning, for conversation, for connecting. Um, if you are new, please let me know in the chat. This is your first time to be here at these events. We'll be sending a recording to everybody uh, within 24 hours this afternoon, so you'll have that. Welcome your first time. Welcome, welcome. Love having you here. Great. So I'm really delighted to bring up Chip Conley onto the stage, who is currently at Rancho La Puerta, uh, supposedly taking um, a little time off and teaching on the side and made some time to be here with us today. Thank you so much, Chip. Well, I've been listening to all of our MEA alums telling me, Chip, you need a vacation. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, I'm having a working vacation because I'm teaching one, a, an hour a day here um, at this venerable old spa. I uh, um, had lunch or breakfast this morning and dinner last night with Deborah Zakely, who is at age 17, started this spa with her 34-year-old husband. Um, and that was 84 yeah. years ago. She's 102. Oh my um, God. And I just, I asked her today, I said, so what what are you better at today than you were 20 or 40 years ago? And she said, I'm a, I'm a better listener, which is something we talk about at MEA in terms of our listening skills, maybe improving with age, knowledge speaks and wisdom listens. Um, and then she said, I'm better at speaking my mind, which is a, which is perfect for Ellen today because I love <laughs> Ellen because she speaks her mind. Um, and so she definitely said, for better I, or worse. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mostly for, for better, I would say. Um, and she said, you know, she has unvarnished insight, which was like, oh my God, that's, that's a term that I've used before. And then she said, I have a better sense of humor. Uh, and as I've said before, I think our sense of humor is the last sense to go away. <laughs> your hearing, your eyes, you know, maybe your smell, but your sense of humor, you know, you can take to your grave. Um, so it's great to be here. I am so honored to have Ellen here. Let's have uh, Carrie introduce Ellen, and then I'm going to start with my questions. Perfect. So you'll be seeing in the chat a series of links. As, as most of you know, Chip is the founder of MEA, the Modern Elder Academy. So we'll be putting some links in there for you to learn more about that. We'll be putting in links for, to learn more about Ellen's work. And how honored are we to have Ellen here? She's considered the mother of mindfulness and the first woman tenured in psychology at Harvard. She's been there for 45 years. 45, yes. Amazing. Author of 11 books, including the international bestseller Mindfulness and her latest work, The Mindful Body, Thinking Our Way, Thinking Our Way to Chronic Health. Do you love that? chronic health. Oh, she's received numerous prestigious awards, has authored over 200 research articles, and her pioneering experience experiments in social psychology have been featured in New York Times Magazine's Year and Ideas issue. And uh, she lives in Cambridge, and we're just delighted that you are here today. I know that there's going to be a lively discussion between the two of you. I can tell already, so as I love to say, I'm going to get my popcorn. I'm going to get off stage. But all of you, I want you to know that we're gonna give you a chance to come up and ask a question live for Ellen and Chip. But that's not now, but it will be later. That's what I love about this format. You'll be able to raise your hand when Chip kind of gives you that cue and come on up and uh, ask the question. So look forward to that. And uh, thank you again, Ellen and Chip, take it away. Yes, thank you, Carrie. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you. Ellen, honored to have you here. Um, we had Gloria Steinem two weeks ago. Now we have you, we're, you know, we're getting all of the, 
the best um, of the female intelligentsia. Um, and I just want to say to you, um, you have been long been somebody I've admired because of your counterclockwise experiment that you did long ago. So let's start with that. I, and then we'll come, we'll go next to your, your newest sure. book, but I want people to understand this, this, um, this uh, ex experiment may not be the right thing. Uh, the no, research, it was an experiment. It was an experiment <laughs> that you did in, in, uh, in the Northeast and maybe New Hampshire or somewhere like that uh, with some men and talk about what you did. Talk about how long ago this was. Yeah, and it's interesting how long it takes for something to get out there in the world. Yeah. But if anybody um, is curious uh, or wants somebody else to know about the study, all they have to do is go to the Simpsons go to Havana. <laughs> and that's when you know you've made it when the Simpsons talk about your work. Um, yeah, so the study was run in um, uh, 1979. And I published it in 1980 or 81, so um, a long time ago. And the idea, this was the first test of my idea of mind-body unity. Now, to give it some background, you know, people think you have a mind, you have a body, and, and that's fine because for most people, what's the difference? But for me, the question is, if you have these two things, how do they talk to each other? How do you get from a fuzzy thing called a thought to something material called the body? And we've all we all know that there you know there's a relationship. You walk down the street, and all of a sudden, a leaf blows in your face. You get startled. Your blood pressure increases, and so on, until you say it was just a leaf. All right. Um, and I had let me tell you, this is fun for me. Um, a very early experience. I didn't have the theory born at this time, um, but this was the first hint of what was to come later in my life. So I was married, th this book, by the way, The Mindful Body started as a memoir. So there are lots of very personal stories in it. One of these stories, I was married when I was obscenely young. So I was 19 going on 40. Um, we went to Paris for our honeymoon <clears throat> and we're in a restaurant and I order a mixed grill. On the mixed grill was pancreas. And I said to my then husband, which of these is pancreas? He was more sophisticated than I. And he pointed that over there. So I ate everything with gusto. And now comes the moment of truth. Now, I still can't understand why at 19, I thought that I had to eat the pancreas because now I was all grown up, but still that's what, okay. So now I'm gonna eat that pancreas. I started eating it and I literally become sick. He then starts laughing. I said, what are you laughing at? He said, that's chicken. You ate the pancreas a long time ago. All right. So I had made myself <laughs> sick. I actually let me interrupt myself with a second pancreas story. I'm probably the only one you know has two pancreas stories. So my mother had breast cancer. It had metastasized to her pancreas. As you know, that's the end game. All right. Now, all of a sudden, it was totally gone. And the medical world couldn't explain it. And the mind-body unity theory that I'll explain in a moment can explain it. So here we had, you know, I had made myself sick. My mother somehow had made herself well. And eventually this would show up in this uh, mind-body unity idea. So I thought, mind-body, these are just words. You know, if I had decided way back before Descartes, I would have had mind-body and elbows to make it interesting, okay? So let's take the mind and the body and you put it back together. And it's one thing, then wherever you're putting the mind, you're simultaneously putting the body. So I have lots of studies that I report in the mindful body um, to test this unity. Now, the world has caught up a little bit. You know, I don't know if you're aware that um, just a few decades ago, the medical world thought uh, that the only way you could get sick was the introduction of a pathogen. You know, I'm sure they wanted everyone to be happy, but whether you're stressed, happy, was irrelevant to your physical health. Okay, so now they've come a distance and they talk about a mind-body connection. And I'm sure I had something to do with that, but how were they connected? You have the same problem as having two distinct things. Right? If it's one thing, uh, the problem is solved. Okay, so we take these old men to a timeless retreat that we retrofitted to 20 years earlier. And we had them live there as if they were their younger selves. So, how old were they? 
they were um, um, 80, around 80, uh, you know, right. morals. And this was, remember, years right. ago when 80 wasn't the new 60. Right. Uh, you know, and if it's that's the case in 20 years, the new zero, I don't get it. But anyway, um, all right. So uh, it wasn't, I didn't have the funds to make it quite a Hollywood set, but that's why we did it in um, a, a monastery. We took out all of the religious icons. So there was nothing there that would suggest any particular time period. And all of the paintings, posters, books, everything was to say, now is the past. And they were going to live there for a week and talk about events that happened in the past, but in the present tense, as if they were just unfolding. I could talk all day about this one, but the, the newer studies are, are as much fun. Anyway, so they're there for a week being their younger selves. As a result of putting the mind and body back together, their vision improved, their hearing improved, their memory, their strength, and they look noticeably younger. Now, as I've already said, we've all both said, this study was done a long time ago. And to this day, I still haven't heard of the medical world coming up with a way for hearing or vision to improve, certainly without medical intervention. Um, okay, so that was quite remarkable. Um, then fast forward, uh, the next study is, is great fun. Um, we take chambermaids. So everybody knows chambermaids. These are the people who are working all day long cleaning hotel rooms, motel rooms. I'm a former First, boutique hotelier, so I, I know a lot oh, about chambermaids. Yes. Okay, well, so you should help and me. And I gave a that. I gave a TED talk about one. Yes. Okay. Seth, so the first thing we do is ask them how much exercise are they getting? Now they uh, think exercise is what you do after work because that's what the Surgeon General who sits in a desk all day believes. So the first interesting thing oh. is. If they're exercising all day long and they're oblivious to it, but they should be healthier than people who are socioeconomically similar who don't exercise, right? Uh, if exercise is good for you, but it turns out they're not. Okay, The study is so simple. We divide them into two groups. And one of the groups, we teach them that their work is exercise. Making a bed is like working at this machine at the gym. You know, cleaning the windows is like working on this other machine. So we have two groups, one who's oblivious to the fact their work is exercise, one whose mind now believes their work is exercise. We take many, many measures before we start. When we're finished, uh, the groups are not eating any differently. One group isn't working any harder than the other. However, the group that changed their minds to see their work as exercise lost weight, there was a change in body mass index, waist to hip ratio, and their blood pressure came down. Now, you know, that's so, so remarkable that I don't usually talk about the next understanding of this because while the world knows what a placebo is, you take a nothing, you think it's something and you heal. This is the reverse of that, a nocebo, where you do something that's supposed to have an effect. It can be medication, or in this case, exercise. But if you don't believe it's having the effect, um, that's the end of the effect. Imagine you go to a doctor and the doctor gives you medicine and the medicine doesn't work. What the doctor is likely to do is uh, increase the dosage. When in fact, what they have to do is enlist our support in it. But anyway, those are measures, you know, this is an important study in mind-body unity and placebo itself this is our best medication, a placebo. But because of the pharmaceutical world, you know, just think, they do a study, they want to bring a drug to market, make a lot of money. They can't bring the drug to market if that damn placebo is just as good. So placebos have gotten a bad rap, but it's our most effective medicine, I believe. I have so many of these studies. Let me just give you, I'll give you maybe two more but you should read the book because they're, they're fun. All right, so um, we inflict a wound. I'm not a sadist. Even if I were, the powers that be wouldn't let me really hurt people, but it's a wound, a little wound. And we have people individually sitting in front of a clock. Unbeknownst to them, the clock is rigged. For a third of the people, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people, it's going half as fast as real time. For a third of the people, it's real time. Now, before I told you this, I'm sure all of you believe the stupid wound is gonna heal when it heals, 
No, the wound heals based on perceived time, clock time. We have people in a sleep lab, they wake up, like I'm big on clocks. So the clock tells them they got two hours more sleep than they got, two hours fewer, or the amount of sleep they got. Biological and cognitive functions follow perceived amount of sleep. So lots of evidence of mind-body unity, not just from, from our lab. There's, this is, this will really surprise you. <laughs> um, there are people who've studied imagined exercise. So, you know, imagine you're going like this, that's for real. Or you're just imagining yourself doing that. The results are the same. It's phenomenal, right? How about if I imagine that I'm going to lose 10 pounds? And I don't know. Possibly. Possibly. Because but remember, remember, most people can't easily imagine these things because, you know, as you say it, you're telling yourself also that's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not going to work with this partial belief. Well, let me, so, so, so this is, first of all, I just love having you here because um, the idea of mindset is a foundational part of our MEA workshops. Um, and so, you know, so every one of our workshops that we do, and we've done about 160, 165 of them now um, are specifically focused on, you know, growth and fixed mindset, et cetera. Well, this was, this was preceded all that work, you know. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, but talk for a minute that about ego slips out every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Ellen, you, you, you're, you, you deserve to be able to <laughs> speak about it. Um, so talk about Becca Levy's work. Becca um, was my student, you know. Okay. So Becca, so we talk about Becca all the time and Be Becca's the seven and a half years, yeah. uh, based upon the research she'd done, you know, previously, in Ohio, I mean, she didn't mm -hmm. invent it, but there was there was data on this. So talk about that, and and to, and maybe talk a little bit about the, the prescriptive value of what what can you do to shift your mindset from a negative to a positive when it comes to getting older. Well, there are so many things. I don't know where to start. Um, you know that um, when you assume you can't do something, you know, there's no science that can show that you can't. Um, and so most of our debilities are a function of our, our mindsets, our beliefs. And so, you know, so let's say for argument's sake that I'm 77, that's not for argument's sake, I am 77, I can argue it. Um, and, you know, and I hurt my wrist. Well, if I'm like many older people, they don't do anything about it because after all, you know, when you get older, you, you just fall apart, right? Now, Carrie uh, is much younger. If Carrie hurts her wrist, she knows her wrist isn't supposed to hurt, so she does things. So then down the road, when her wrist is fine and mine is not, um, it has nothing to do with our age. <clears throat> I teach Harvard students and um, I give this lecture on aging. And uh, before I do this, I start and I ask them, so the, the classmates on Tuesday and Thursday, and I say, what was the last thing I said on Tuesday? These are Harvard students. They're young kids. They're the smartest. They have no idea. All right? And that's the beginning to say, yes, you are also not infrequently forgetful. The major difference is when you don't remember, you don't worry about it. Okay, so now there are lots of things that change as you get older, you know, and, and you mentioned that uh, before we were talking to other people, some of the things you, you just, or you, you just don't care about some of the, the things you worried about before. So when I was a young up and coming, and let's say you're introducing me to five important people, I'm going to learn their names. I tell you, this may be obnoxious, I don't care, you know. I don't care who they are. If it's the case that I'm going to have continued interaction with them, there'll be more opportunities to learn their name. Okay, so now you've just told me it's, you know, uh, Dan, Bob, Jeff, and Steve, but you gave me their full names. Um, now, um, Carrie says to me, you know, who was that? I said, I don't remember. It's not a problem of memory. To uh, forget something, you have to have learned it in the first place. Okay, so what I'm saying, values change. Um, and if you don't learn it in the first place, you're not going to remember it in the second place. And there's no problem with that. 
I think that uh, memory loss is uh, grossly overrated, um, over worried about, and the worry itself causes more of it. I had this fun thing. I wrote about this in one of my books um, that uh, a friend of mine told me the story. She said to her mom, mom, what's Susie's last name? And her mother said to her, Susie who? She said, Susie Goldberg. <laughs> you know, and so I, many of us try to remember things out of context where it really doesn't matter, you know, and if it doesn't matter, why should you remember it? But I, I am suggesting that for most of us under most circumstances, who cares? And um, so uh, if you believe that something is going to happen at all ages, not just old, that what you do is look for evidence. Now there's lots of data on um, hypothesis com uh, confirming data searches. Whatever you look for, you're gonna find, essentially. If you say to yourself, how am I wonderful? You're gonna find evidence that you're wonderful. If you said, how am I awful? You're gonna find evidence that you're awful. All right, so the questions we ask ourselves at all ages are important. When you get older, there are so many stereotypes uh, that speak to decrements and performance um, that it's even easier to find evidence. Um, you know, and you look at books, I, I have a slide on some of the stuff in my class where you, they still talk about the, the old grumbling of a, of a person is this, you know, either a nasty, small, uh, gr yellow teeth, uh, you know, individual. Um, and, you know, I, I had asked, but you'll, you might find this interesting. Um, years ago, I, when I was young, I was 30 something, I was in this conference, invited to this very, very conference of very important people uh, who were all in their 50s. And we were supposed to figure out what we were going to do in the year 20, I don't remember, it was 2020 or 2024 when there are going to be an awful lot of old people. And so I go, I'm Susie Sunshine, and I'm very positive, and all these people are very negative about what happens when you get older. And so I said to my, what am I doing? <laughs> Why do I believe these things? Um, and then I realized that, and I did research to, to assess this. Okay, so when you're a kid, your grandmother usually represents what it means to be old, right? And so if she's a young old, then that's what it means to be old. And that's what my grandmother was. So I tested this by looking at people who live with their grandmother first when they were little, I'm making this up now, four years, five years old, I don't remember, versus those who first lived with their grandmother when they were 12 years old. Now, for the five or let's say the seven year old, the grandmother is younger, you're smaller. So the grandmother is bigger, more vibrant than when you, and then we go and we take people who, who lived with their grandmother, either you know, younger or older, um, and see how they age themselves. And those who had the younger image of the grandmother, themselves age better. They were more active, more alert. So, you know, we, we take pictures of, and, and people, to, to go back to the hypothesis can data firming idea, that people think they can tell how old somebody is. So what happens is when you see somebody that looks old, you think they're old. The person could be young, just not having taken much care of themselves. Or the person could be um, old, looking very young. But each time you see the person, you're confirming your stereotype about what an old person looks like. Is that? Well, yes. And and so for our community here listening in, do you like what are what are some tips to have a, a different perspective on a different mindset on aging? So, yeah, well, um, I think that as soon as you say you can't, you should say, how do I know that? And you should try it. I think people have a misconception about what a successful life is. You know, oh, if only I could do whatever that thing. You know, so let's say playing golf. That <clears throat> if only I could keep getting a hole in one. Well, if you got a hole in one, complete success, every time you swung the club, there'd be no game. So the degree of success we look for 
would not actually be good for us. You take a little kid and the kid is in the elevator. We've all been in there. And uh, wants to press the elevator button, but isn't tall enough. So your mother or father picks you up and you press the elevator. And then the next time you're in the elevator, it's the same thing. You're getting a little taller and you know, it's still great fun. Then comes a time where look, you can press the button yourself. So what happens? How many of you have been excited about being in elevators? Right. Yeah. You know, so once you, so you can either perform tasks perfectly mindlessly or imperfectly mindfully. So we shouldn't be so upset um, with being imperfect. Imperfect gives us an opportunity to experience what it's like to to master things. To um, you know, and others have said before me that it's the journey that matters. This is just another way of putting that. All right. So what I'm suggesting is uh, all the things you think you can't do because you're old. Um, and now actually there are so many people who break that stereotype. The, all you need to do is say, you know, I don't know, are there any old skiers? I say, oh, look at that. My God, that guy's 10 years older than I am. Are there any old people running marathons? You know, and go through the list and say, well, if they can do it, you know, then maybe we can do it. Then I have this, um, uh, I don't know what I'll call it, but strategy for lack of the, the right word, um, is um, uh, about Zeno. Okay, so I don't know if you know Zeno's paradox with respect to distance is if you always go half the distance, you're never gonna get to where you wanna go. So let's make it easy. You're a foot away from where you wanna be. Then you're a half a foot. Then you're a quarter of a foot. Then you're an eighth, you never get there. I said, Zeno was a, you know, a cynic. I said, so here's Ellen's reverse Zeno's paradox. Whatever you want to do, there's always a step small enough from where you are to where you want to be to get there. So, you know, you talked about losing weight. So you eat a box of cookies a day, okay? And you can't get yourself to stop. Well, so eat half a box. You can't eat half a box, eat a quarter of a box less. You can't eat, a, everybody can eat one crumb less, all right? And so then you're on your path. Um, you know, and the the journey again is what's exciting. Once you get there, you know, I mean, I, I recently lost a fair amount of weight. It was very exciting for a little while. Okay, so now it's no longer because I need something else to keep me busy. You know, that um, uh, I think, okay, so when you see yourself as old, you say, oh, my hearing is gone. Well, I want you to do the study. I, I never did this. <laughs> uh, nobody in the world agrees with this. But I think that there's a great advantage to becoming hard of hearing. You get to a certain point in life, you see nobody is saying anything anyway. <laughs> and so all of the talk that you're missing, you know, no longer distracts you. And I don't know if there's any truth to that, but well, it is the case that there's an upside often hidden to whatever we see as a debility. Yes, I did. There is definitely some research that shows someone who's hard of hearing is better at seeing and that they actually. They... Okay, well, I talk, yeah, I talk about that in the mindful body because if it's the case that our seeing can improve, why do we have to lose our hearing for our seeing to improve? Yeah. Why do we have to lose our hearing for our seeing to improve? Right. It says these things are not fixed. And, you know, uh, so I have a lot of respect for my colleagues. But as a rule, they take things that are down here and they can move them to here, make them a little. To me, and I talk about this in the book, there's a better than better way for almost everything. Let me give you an example. This one is kind of fun. I'm very sensitive to language. This comes out of that. Many years ago, I was asked to give a sermon at one of the Harvard hospitals, um, one of the Harvard um, Good. Sure. Okay, sure. rest it. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, okay, I'm bye. I'm Jewish and I'm not very religious. So um this was going to be an unusual thing. And I said yes, because I tend to say yes to everything. Okay. So now what am I going to talk about? I have no idea. And I think can I come up with well, maybe I'll talk about forgiveness. It's not religion, but I think I could get away with it. Okay. So I start to think about uh forgiveness. And what I come up with is almost sacrilegious, all right? So here it goes. If you ask 10 people, 
is um, forgiveness good or bad? What are they going to tell you? Okay, you're good. It's good, right? If you ask 10 people, is blame good or bad? What are they going to tell you? It's bad. It's bad. Well, wait a second. <laughs> you have to blame before you forgive. Well, that's interesting right there. Our forgivers are our blamers. Okay, now, do you blame people for good things or bad things? You blame people for bad things, but things in and of themselves are neither good nor bad. It's our framing of things that make it so, all right? Um, that means people who see the world negatively blame and then forgive. And I think that's hardly divine. Um, that certainly if you blame, you're better off forgiving. So that's, you know, people start off their blamers and then therapists and whoever else, lots of psychologists study forgiveness. Forgiveness is better. There's a whole other way of being in this world. Okay, so if, and this, it's so funny, Chip, that, or I know it's funny, it's important to me. You know, I have lots of life and death findings. I have findings where, you know, we've helped people with all sorts of chronic illnesses and so on. But this is the most important thing in the 45 years I've been doing this um, that I've come up with. So simple. Behavior makes sense from the actor's perspective or else the actor wouldn't do it. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know, today I'm gonna be aggressive, obnoxious and clumsy. Okay, so when people are, are being that way, what's behind it? So the reason this is so important, so let's take me. So I am very gullible. And I'm, I'm probably, again, the only person you know who's been taken by two psychopaths, not one, I don't learn, all right? So you're gonna try to make me less gullible. And we're both gonna look back at what I've done and say, yeah, I, mean, I agree, help me out of this. But no matter how long you try to help me, uh, it's going to fail. Why? Because going forward, what I'm being is trusting. The only way I can stop being gullible is if I stop value being trusting. And I don't want to, I, I've, I'd rather be taken um, because I value that about myself. Now you, Chip, I don't know you long enough, but you can drive a person crazy because you're, oh, so, time. Because you're <laughs> so inconsistent. And I'll show you all the ways you're inconsistent, but you're not going to change either because from your perspective, you're being flexible. So it turns out for each and every negative understanding we have of a behavior, there's an equally strong but oppositely balanced alternative. So I gave people, I don't know, 200, 300 of these um, behavior descriptions. And I said, circle those things you keep trying to change about yourself and you keep failing. So for me, I'd circle um, gullible, impulsive, and I won't tell you the rest. Then you turn the sheet over, and in a mixed up order are the positive versions of these. Now people are told, circle those things you really value about yourself. And I value my spontaneity and my being trusting. And as long as I value my spontaneity, I'm going to at times seem impulsive. As long as I value being trusting, I'm going to seem gullible. So what does this do? This means that all of the things we take ourselves to task for are from the observer's perspective. And if we ask going forward why we did what we did, we'd see that it always makes sense. So we like ourselves better. We like the people we're with better. I don't want anyone to ever forgive me. I, I don't want to be forgiven. I'm a nice person. I did not do anything wrong. I did what made sense from my perspective or I wouldn't have done it. What I want is for you to understand me. And that understanding obviates the need for forgiveness. So you see, we had um, blame, forgiveness. Oh, but then this better than better way. And there are um, uh, lots of examples of this um, in, uh, that I give in the book. One that may be worth talking about is um, about cancer. So I go to see my friend Eva. She had a terrible cancer. And I said, Eva, how are you? 
She said, um, well, she just got back from Mass General, one of the Harvard hospitals, and they said her cancer's in remission. Now, remission is certainly better than an active case of cancer, but there's a better than better way. Right at that moment, I said, wait a second. If I took those very same tests, presumably they tell me I don't have cancer. Why is it I don't have it, but you have it in remission? You know, when you have a cold, the cold doesn't go into remission. It might be maybe something dormant inside of you, but you see yourself as cured. And with each cold that you cure, you become less frightened of you know, another cold. It's the same thing with cancer. If cancer comes back, in some ways it's the same cancer. Okay, that's when we talk about remission. But in just as many ways, it's brand new. It's, everything looks the same and different. If we assume, if we look at the ways it's different, a different cancer, potential coming, then we're best off seeing ourselves as cured. Okay, so you could have active cancer. You could see the cancer is in remission. That's better. Better still is seeing yourself as cured. Now, I've been fighting with the medical world. But I say I wouldn't put these things out there without double checking, you know? So the first thing I did with this idea was I called Susan Love and when she was alive, she was leading breast cancer expert. And I said, I don't wanna endanger anybody, but it seems to me, and she said, no, she tells all of her patients um, where others might say they're in remission that they cured. Okay, so what happens? A woman has breast cancer, the breast cancer goes into remission and the medical world then says, we're gonna wait five years until we give you a clean bill of health. I wanna know on um, what data that's based. And no one has been able to tell me. It just seems like it's pretty good. And then they're, they're you know, saving themselves. But I believe, and this is a, a big one, I believe stress is the major killer. Yep. Much bigger than most people would assume. Everybody now knows stress is bad for you. I believe, that if we took, oh, you know, 500 people with, you know, let's test three different kinds, um, five different kinds of cancers. And it's, you tell somebody they have cancer, nobody's going to be happy. So let's give them three weeks to adjust. And then we measure their stress level once a month or every three weeks, whatever. I believe that stress level will determine the course of disease over and above genetics, nutrition, and even treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody knows stress isn't good for you. Stress is psychological. Stress is not a function of events. Structure, stress is a function of the view you take of events. You open it up and uh, recognize things in a more mindful way. It can be many different things. Stress dissipates. Let me throw a one-liner for those of you. I can't see hands here. How many of you suffer stress? Okay. Okay. So here's a good one for you, um, which is next time you're stressed, ask yourself, is it a tragedy or an inconvenience? It's almost never a tragedy. I, you know, missed the bus. I banged the car. I burned the dinner. I didn't write the report, you know, and just asking that, then we become a little easier on ourselves. Now ask yourself for the last three times you were stressed, did the events actually happen? Most of the time, the things we worry about don't happen. And if it did happen, now that you're around for us to talk about it, obviously you had a way to deal with it. So basically, you know, you use the rule, no worry before it's time. All right, so stress requires two things. One, a belief that something's going to happen. And two, that when it happens, it's going to be awful. So let's deal with the first part. Something is going to happen. It turns out prediction is an illusion. Everybody thinks they can predict. Prediction is an illusion. Ask yourself three, give yourself three, five reasons why this thing um, probably won't happen or might not happen. So you went from believing it'll never, you know, it'll definitely happen to maybe it won't and you immediately feel better. I'm gonna come back to prediction in a minute. But then go to the harder part. Let's assume it does happen. How is that actually an advantage? 
you know, you're worried you're going to be fired and nobody in this group, but that's one of the things people worry about. Well, could you imagine, I can't, being in a job, you show up for 40 hours every week and you're hating it? The best thing in the world for most of these people would be something that pushes them to, you know, to redesign their lives. And a story I tell in the book, um, because you can say, well, come on, Ellen, I'm you and you're, you know, living in the stratosphere. What do you know? Okay, so I had this major fire that destroyed 80% of what I owned. Um, I get home one day from a dinner at a friend's house. All my neighbors are outside, which was itself lovely. This was in the middle of the winter. Um, so I wouldn't have to face this alone. I call the insurance agent the next day and I tell him he comes and he said it was the first time in his career that the damage was worse than the call. Everybody, oh my God, oh my God. And he gets here and it's not so bad. But for me, I had already lost the things. Throwing my sanity away after it was not going to be useful. Um, okay, so now I go to the Charles Hotel because I don't have a place to live. And I'm a sight to be seen with my two little dogs. And I'm needing to say hello to everybody all the time. So people knew who I was. Okay, so now it's Christmas Eve. I leave to go out with friends on Christmas Eve. I come back to the hotel room and it's full of gifts. Not from the people who own the hotel, not from the managers, but from the so-called little people, the people who park my car, the chambermaids who clean the room, the waiters and waitresses who took care of me for my meals. I, I, it took me years to be able to tell that story without it making me cry happy tears. Every Christmas, I'm reminded about the goodness of so many people out there. And except for one thing, I don't remember anything that I lost in that fire. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that one thing. All right, so this is Christmas in January. Um, semester is going to begin again, and I have to teach a large lecture class, and my notes were all destroyed. I didn't want to go to my colleagues and have somebody else teach it. You know, nobody would have been able to um, on such short notice. I didn't want to screw the department and just cancel the course. It's a big course. So I'm going to teach this course. How am I going to teach this course when I don't have any of my materials? Then I get this idea. <laughs> it was a great idea. I called one of the students who got an A in the course the last time I taught it. And I borrowed that student's notes. <laughs> It's like a game of telephone. And, you know, so I begin the class. I tell people the story, um, basically apologizing for what's going to unfold. And because I didn't have my notes to mindlessly rely on, um, the course was completely fresh and probably the best class I ever gave. Mm. Well, um, so, you know, this is a cliche, but turning lemons into lemonade seems to be. Yes. A big piece of your thinking. We are going to open it up for questions in just a moment. But, um, let, me, but let me go back. Can I go back to one thing, Chip? Please. I threw something out and I don't think people fully appreciate it. When I say we can't predict. Now, um, if you were going to, let's say, uh, Michael Jordan and I are going to take foul shots, okay? If we're shooting 20 foul shots, he's going to win. That's what you should bet on. You can predict it and you're likely to make money. However, if we're shooting one foul shot, you know, sometimes he misses. Sometimes he you know, has an ache. Sometimes he has a fight with his wife, you know, whatever it is. And I often, clearly not as often as he, make it. Would you wager your entire life savings that for this one shot, he's going to win? You wouldn't do it, all right? So what is the bottom line? We can predict to the group we can't predict the individual event, all right? Now, for most of us, for everything that we're doing in life, we're predicting the individual, you know, it's, it's nice you tell me the surgery was successful for 80% of the people who had it, you know, great, is it gonna work for me, all right? Um, and that we can't be sure of. But if you turn that inside out, um, when we talked about older people, and true for everybody, you, know, you can't be sure that that negative thing is going to happen. Um, positive, negative, and your experience of it 
determines whether you see it as positive or negative. Okay, I've thrown a lot out. Ask me yeah. a question. Yeah. <laughs> you, yes, you have. Um, Andy Raskin had his hand up. Uh, let's see, if you wanna actually uh, go ahead and raise your hand, you can do that at the uh, React uh, part down below. Um, and uh, Andy, did you wanna actually ask the question or not? Sure, I, I took it down because I, I I wasn't sure if this should be the first question, but uh, so basically I've been hearing about uh, UChip for a long time and, uh, and your work and uh, I am basically, this is the first, uh, the first, uh, in interaction that I've seen with you. And, uh, it's really interesting to me to hear Ellen talk about, uh, your frustrating inconsistencies. So, uh, <laughs> I, I thought that would be, uh, fun well, to, uh, hear uh, if it's, if it's not, if, if it's in the spirit of like, uh, you know, you'd enjoy that. Uh, I thought, you know, maybe, uh, I'll ask you, Chip, if, if, if that I, would be I, okay to hear about. I would say that, um, Ellen is intuitive, but she doesn't know me very well. And she doesn't, she barely knows me. She, she, we, no, we, I just we, made that up. I could have said anything. I could have said yeah. he was stubborn, but the other okay. of that is that he values being stable. No, no matter what she said, it's true. So mm. thank you, Andy. <laughs> uh, let's go Okay, you can go to the next question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. I'm, th I'm glad you're here, Andy. Brian, what's up? We lost Brian's video. Brian is frozen. Okay, Brian. Okay, Brian, we'll come you back. Hear you. Yeah, I better go quickly. Okay. We have load shedding here in South Africa. But Ellen, I wonder if you can explain your conception or how you explain the mind. Because as a physician, you know, I always thought about that. When I cut open a cadaver back in medical school, I can see the brain, right? I see a physical specimen. And when we talk about these kinds of things with patients, often that's considered woo-woo or and yeah. I'm sure the medical industrial complex in the United States is quite the same. So can you explain mind? No. Um, and, you know, uh, I uh, people have tried to explain consciousness and see consciousness is that be phenomenal and so on. Um, um, I want to avoid those difficulties because there's there are real changes we can make. And these experiments have, have produced findings that are reliable and important without knowing, you know, some special definition of mind. Um, but one of the things that you made me think, Brian, is that so many um, medical people in the past learned about the body from a cadaver. Okay. And they learn about it mindlessly, right? and then use that knowledge going forward. Um, so this is a, a strange analogy, but um, so Brian, when you're driving on ice, what part of the world are you in, by the way? It's in South Africa. South oh, Africa, okay. but you were South Africa where it gets cold or it doesn't get cold. So you're visiting the States, you're driving on ice. You drive, yes? Yes. Okay, so you're driving on ice, the car starts to skid, what do you do? Out of control as much as ah, okay do you, do you do anything with the brakes yeah I let uh take my foot off the gas is what i would think to do immediately as to not add any more pressure okay so what most people in this country would say which is not entirely different is that you gem gently pump the brakes so that's what we learned at time one and that's for safety's sake right but it turns out now that there are anti-lock brakes, for safety's sake, what you should do is jam on the brakes. So the very opposite of what we were taught, right? Things change, our minds hold them still. And so that's essentially what mindlessness is all about. It made sense at time one, we keep doing it, the world is changing and we're oblivious to it. And so all of the people who've learned from cadavers um, there are, you know, there are things that are um, being mislearned. You know, it was the best we could do way back when. Absolutely. In fact, um, I'm writing about in a chapter for a co-author research book, and it's titled literally Beyond the Diagnosis. I always say the physician understands what they can see and, and right. understand diagnosis, but there's something underneath that diagnosis in terms yeah. of what I teach, what I teach people, this to me seems so important mm -hmm. is people need to realize 
that science only gives us probabilities. These probabilities are translated as absolute facts. And if you know something absolutely, you just do it. You don't pay attention. So I'm at this horse event. This man asked me, can I watch his horse for him? Because he wants to get his horse a hot dog. I'm an A++ student. I have to keep myself from laughing at him, right? He comes back with the hot dog and the horse ate it. And that's when I realized everything I thought I knew could be wrong. Right. And so what I want to do is take the whole medical world and make them aware of what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And when you know you don't know, you tune in. And none of us know. We can't know because everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives. Yeah. When I was uh, Ellen, just I, th first of all, Brian, thank you for calling in from South Africa. Um, I, I was talking with my uh uh, my oncologist two weeks ago, because I have stage three prostate cancer that spread. And he told me one day, I have a 20, that based upon all my data, I had a 22% chance of living another 10 years. And what does that mean, Chip? Well, then you the very either next... will live it or you won't live it. Well, it's like I said, a 20% okay, chance. Okay, go on. I was like, I, I was incredulous, like 22%, that's not very good. I'm, I'm 63. I'm like, what are you talking about? The next day he said, oh, we have some new data and now it's 80%. <laughs> I, was like, I mean, it's a true story. People yeah, on my team yeah, know about beautiful. this. Like, are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, like, how can you go from 22% to 80% in one yeah. day? Well, yeah. It, it's, it's newer data. It's like, well. Like, well, people need to understand from the beginning that yeah. these are best guesses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, you know, people think, so I talk a lot about uh, chronic illness because People think when you have a chronic illness um, that things are going to stay the same or get worse. And all chronic means is the medical world doesn't have a solution. But there are many things that we can be doing with any chronic illness, not the least of which is just increase our mindfulness, our active noticing. Neurons are firing, and I have a lot of data that that's literally and figuratively enlivening. Second, what I had said to you about the um, imagined exercise, so if you are, um, you know, bedridden, um, you don't have to just sit there. You can be doing the exercise. And then I've come up with something uh, called attention to symptom variability, which is a, a fancy word for being mindful, noticing change um, that we've done with people who have multiple sclerosis, um, Parkinson's, uh, stroke, arthritis, chronic pain, real big ones, right? And very simple. Um, that we call them periodically. You could do this for yourself, just you know, set your phone to ring and then you ask yourself a question. First question is, is that whatever the symptom, better or worse than the last time we called, we checked in, um, and why? That why means now you're going to increase your mindfulness, right? Mm -hmm. So several things happen when you do this. The first is that when you have a chronic illness, you feel helpless. Um, now by having something to do, we eliminate part of that and helplessness is not good for your health. Second, by noticing the, the symptom is changing because you thought you were always awful. Now you see, you know, uh, that that's not true. There's some variability. Third, by asking the why question, you're doing this mindful search, it's good for you. And fourth, I believe if you're looking for a solution, you're more likely to find one than if you're not. And there are no negative side effects. Yeah. You know, and you don't, you can go to your doctor for your prostate, you know, uh, problem um, while you're doing this and maybe even give the doctor some of the information. Yeah. But um, those are big diseases where we've been able to ameliorate the, the symptoms. That's very prescriptive. Thank you. I'm going to, we're going to go to Ken Dykewald. I think somebody you might know. I don't know. If yeah, I can. Yeah, there you go. Ken. Yeah. First, let me say that I've been sort of on this beat for 50 years now, and I've never encountered anyone whose thinking was more profound and clear than yours. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to make 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 that point. That um, And then I've got a very simple question for you uh, about which I'd like to hear you speculate. So when the body dies, does any part of the mind persist? Yeah, this is like the, uh, the first question that Brian asked me. Very similar. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, Speculate. Uh, my, my guess, you know, whatever my guess is, is no more informed than, you know, than anybody else's. 
Um, I think that eventually, and maybe this is some answer to it, you're saying, we're going to find energy being more important, you know, and, and energy doesn't go away. Now, whether that means that when I die, I'm gonna be eventually a puppy, you know, or a flower, or just in the, you know, I don't know. But, um, and, and as you know, better than I even, that those sorts of thoughts are very calming to older people. Um, and so, you know, if we don't have any evidence against it, why not believe it? Uh, but every belief we have should be conditional, should be who knows, maybe. And then Thank you pay you. some attention. What is your view of that? Throw it back at you. Yeah, I'm inclined to think that the body dies, but there's dimensions of the mind that get poured back into a kind of a cosmic yeah. dance. And yeah. um, it may be that I just want to believe that, or I've encountered that on as a young man. You just spent various... so much time at the Esalen Institute, and yeah, that's yeah. From. Well, no, no, no. I mean, I'm not dis okay. So let me tell you, if you read the Mindful Body, I had a whole chapter. It was called the Woo Woo chapter. <laughs> my and you know, publishers wanted me to get rid of, so I got rid of a lot of it, but I kept some. And but here's an experiment that we did. It's mind blowing, but speaks you know, you have to stretch your mind to see how it's relevant, but okay. So you're sitting, you're the participant and the experimenter is mindful or mindless. And you all know what I mean. When I say mindful, you're actively noticing mindless. You're like a robot depending on the past, right? Okay. So now put that aside for just one second. We give people an index card. So simple. It says Mary had a, a little lamb. Nobody sees the double word. Nobody, okay? Um, we say, I'll pay you for accuracy. It doesn't matter what we say, how many words were there? Mary had a little lamb, five. Okay, so now you're the participant. The experimenter is mindful or mindless. Not talking to you, not doing anything, just standing next to you. When that experimenter is mindful, you see the double letter. You know, um, and that needs to be replicated. And I, you know, when I wrote about it, I sort of make all the, you know, look, this is a finding. <laughs> don't, you know, don't slaughter me. I mean, the way they did with Daryl Bem. Um, but um, I think that in another 20 years, we're going to have a very different physics. I'm not a physicist, so I can't, can't tell you, you know, what it's going to be. But um, I think energy will play a bigger part. You know, I had this, uh, this is the woo-woo experience that nobody knows about because I, I had to take it out of the book. So I just get back from Japan. I'm with my partner. Um, we say, where are we going to go next? Oh, we can't afford it, which is a strange thing to say because somebody is always paying for my trips. But nevertheless, we spent a lot of money. Um, what's the name of that place? And we can't remember. Oh, yeah, Kuala Lumpur. It sounded very exotic. So, but, you know, but yeah, all right, let's see if we can go to Kuala Lumpur, even though it's far away and it's expensive. I said, how are we going to pay for it? I said, maybe I can give a talk at the Harvard Club. Now, this is the first thing that's totally insane. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I know nobody at any Harvard Club. I don't even know what the Harvard Club is. You know, a club of people. I assume who went to Harvard. That's it. The next day, I get a phone call from the Harvard Club of Kuala Lumpur, inviting me to come over and give a talk. Now I have ended more relationships with statisticians than I can tell you by asking, explain this to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so when you look at all of the strange things that some of the strange things we can always you know, find a way of explaining, but there are lots of bizarre experiences. And if we were able to sort of gather all of them, um, I think they'd be meaningful. Here is one. We have a study right now. You know, they're called mukbox. I don't know. Uh, Asian kids spend time watching videos of somebody eating pizza. That's the whole thing. You're 20 minutes, a half hour, you're watching somebody eat pizza. Okay, so we use these. One group is supposed to imagine that you're eating the pizza with that person, chewing it, smelling it, tasting it, okay? Another group just counts the number of time the person chewed. So make sure that they're watching the video. Now we just use those two groups. I don't have the data yet, but the question is, will imagining yourself eating the pizza result in weight loss or weight gain? You know, weight gain 
most women of my age can tell you years ago, we used to say, I just have to look at a donut and I gain weight <laughs> and maybe something to that. Uh, the weight loss is easier to explain. Um, and, you know, if we get, if we get the uh, uh, weight gain, that will lead to, and nobody's going to believe it. I'll have to do it 13 times. Somebody else will do it. And then we'll have to change part of physics. Wow. So I'm going to have to, we are at the bottom of the hour and I'm going to say thank you to um, Ash. I'm so sorry we didn't get to you next. And Sembe in Japan and Art, who I'm on a podcast with tomorrow. Um, and Amanda, sorry, I can't get to you. What I can say is a huge thank you to Ellen. Um, you are a force to be reckoned with. Um, we love you in our community now. You get a little sense of our global MEA community. My favorite time of the year is fall and my favorite time of the year for both our Baja Michael. campus and our I Santa Fe up campus. in the garage. Oh, let's, Teresa, let's turn you off there. Um, my favorite time of the year in both Baja and Santa Fe is the fall. So for those of you who are thinking about like, I love this conversation. I want to check out MEA workshops in the fall. Check them out on the MEA website, meawisdom.com. And Ellen, you know, maybe we're going to have you teach a workshop someday. Sure, why not? Sure, why not? Yes. Well, she says yes to everybody, but like, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll see about that. I, I, I will I will make the ask. But uh, I don't I, know if, it, if it's possible because I, you know, I can stay on a, a little while longer if uh, the people who have questions want to ask me the question. If everybody else who has to go goes, that's fine too. Oh my gosh. Well, that, I mean, we You're could- You're so generous. We, we typically do wrap right at the bottom of the hour. Um, so those of you who do have questions, perhaps you can send them in to us, but we are gonna, we're gonna wrap this one up for today. Okay. Thank you so much, Ellen and Chip. What a mind blowing, literally, conversation. I hope all of you have the sense of chronic health that you can bring with you forward into your life. We will send you the recording. You can share it with your friends. It will be also on our website. Uh, so thank you. Thank you again. A beautiful, beautiful hour. Fun. Thank you, everyone. Stay well. Thank you, Ellen. Stay well. Thank Bye. you, Carrie. Bye, everyone.